The Word of the Lord from the Apostle Paul's Letter to the Philippians, Chapter 1, Verses 1 to 11. Paul and Timothy, servants of Christ Jesus, to all the saints in Christ Jesus who are at Philippi, with the overseers and deacons, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. I thank my God and all my remembrance of you, always in every prayer of mine to you all, making my prayer with joy because of your partnership in the gospel from the first day until now. And I am sure of this, that he who began a good work in you will bring it to completion at the day of Jesus Christ. It is right for me to hold this way about you all because I hold you in my heart for you are all partakers with me of grace, both in my imprisonment and in the defense and confirmation of the gospel. For God is my witness, how I yearn for you all with the affection of Christ Jesus. And it is my prayer that your love may abound more and more with knowledge and all discernment, so that you may approve what is excellent and so be pure and blameless for the day of Christ, filled with the fruit of righteousness that comes through Christ Jesus, to the glory and praise of God. This is the word of the Lord. Good morning. It's so good to be with you this morning from our church sanctuary. My name is Brian Scott. I'm the new lead pastor here at Twin City Bible Church. We're excited for this fall semester. You know, as we were singing a, a moment ago, I, I wish I could have joined the worship team. I didn't meet the language requirement. I mean, Portuguese, French, Chinese, I'll just stick to preaching God's word. And, and speaking of God's word, I'm excited about our new series called Rooted. We're going to be walking through the book of Philippians this fall. But I did want to say this. I am excited to meet you. Uh, if you've been a part of the church for a long time or if you're new joining us this morning, or if you're a student here on campus, uh, I'd love to meet you. My wife and I and family will be at our home. Uh, if you want to drive by or drive through, that is, uh, this afternoon, you can check our address on the TCBC Family Room on Facebook. Uh, if you can't make it by there, if you don't have uh, transportation, you can walk up to uh, the church office here right across from campus, either this afternoon or on Tuesday. We'd love to meet you and uh, also hope to be able to get uh, one of the Philippians journals into your hands so that we can enjoy God's word together over the course of this semester. I'm going to just pray and jump into the sermon. Father, thank you for your grace. Thank you that despite social distance challenges, we could be together to worship you. And Lord, we ask now that you would speak to us in Jesus name. Amen. The, the book of Philippians, this letter that Paul the Apostle writes to the church in Philippi, it's important to understand he's writing from prison. And if you think about all the things that could go on while you were confined, uh, thinking about your own personal survival, thinking about what landed you in prison in the first place, Paul references the fact that he's there because he was preaching and he was confirming and defending the gospel. But Paul's not thinking about himself. He's not self-centered or self-pitying. While he's in prison, Paul writes this letter. He's thinking about other people. And in fact, when we read uh, through the, this letter, to read through this book, as we will over the course of the, the semester, we'll find that Paul is expressing things like joy, peace. He's able to quickly forgive those who wrong him. He talks about not complaining. He talks about having assurance. These are not the th typical things that you would think of of a person who is in prison. How's Paul able to have those attributes while he's in such a confinement? If, a few weeks ago, we had the, uh, the infamous derecho, or derecho, however you pronounce that, uh, that came through and blew some trees down and you know, created some damage, obviously created a lot of damage in Iowa and feel for those people who experienced that. And you think about life in the Midwest and specifically Champaign-Urbana, how many storms pass through in a season, yet so many trees survive. 
And not only in a year, but also decade after decade. And in fact, I've mentioned this uh, in many a, a while ago, but there's a tree, at least one, in Urbana that's older than our country. It was planted in 1761. Think about how many storms that tree has been through, yet it still thrives. How does Paul thrive in a prison? How do trees thrive through storms year after year, decade after decade, century after century? It's because they're rooted. Paul was rooted in Christ. Trees, of course, are deeply rooted in the ground, and tree experts will tell us that a tree is about half of it above ground and half of it below ground, not so much necessarily the depth that it goes, but how broad it spreads to maintain its stability and to get nutrients. A tree's roots will go two to three times wider in the ground than its widest part above ground. And so when you consider all of the roots that are happening and you match that to the, the trunk and all the branches above ground, it's about half below, half half above. And so trees are deeply rooted and are able to withstand storms. Paul was deeply rooted in Christ and was not only able to withstand being in prison, but he's able to talk about things that for many of us are, are fleeting or they escape us so often. Today's message I've entitled Rooted in Christ, the Fruit of Joy. Rooted in Christ, the Fruit of Joy. And as we think about joy, joy, by the way, is mentioned one time in the pet, this passage that we just read and heard from Ellen. But really, it's alluded to multiple times and in multiple ways. So how do we have joy? Where does it come from? Well, there's at least three ways. There's three ways that we're going to talk about. But at least three ways that this passage mentions how we can have joy. Number one, assurance having assurance of our salvation. Number two, affection, having right affection that's rooted in Christ, affection for one another. And thirdly, abundance. And Paul's talking about our love for God, that it might be in abundance. So assurance, affection, abundance. Assurance. Paul mentions a prayer that's motivated by joy. And if you think about his prayer, it's really all-encompassing. The indefinite pronoun, all and every, is throughout. In verse 4, he says, Always in every prayer of mine for you all, making my prayer with joy. Joy is accompanying his prayer. There's a joy basis from which he prays as he is thankful for these people. Again, he's in prison. Paul's talking about joy while he is in prison. Think about our present circumstances. Joy is probably not at the top of our list of things that we're feeling right now as we head into the school year and as the fall has come upon us. In fact, joy, though circumstantially is very challenging currently, is something that evades Christians oftentimes. Uh, David Martin Lloyd-Jones, who was one of the probably top two preachers in the 20th century in Great Britain, he talks about spiritual depression. And he talks about how many Christians don't have joy in their lives, and they lack that joy often because they're so busy trying to live up to the standard of what it means to be a Christian. In other words, so busy trying to do, they have not understood what it means to have something having, having already been done on their behalf. And so as a result, they have this spiritual depression. They see joy in other Christians, but don't have joy in their own heart. And they feel this sense of, I'm lacking, I'm missing something. And he gives this example of John Wesley. John Wesley was a minister, a preacher, and ultimately the founder of what we know today as the Methodist Church. And John Wesley was one of these Christians um, before a certain point that had this sort of spiritual depression. And he was so busy trying to preach to prisoners, trying to, he, he left college, he got into a boat and he was crossing the Atlantic Ocean, which we think about trans, you know, Atlantic you know, uh, travel as being a no big deal. 
these days, but think about being on a boat and facing all the storms and imminent danger. And it was this, on this passage to cross the Atlantic, to come to America and preach here in the United States, um, he realized he was missing something because he was on a boat with these Moravians. And though this storm was raging against their ship and it was not a guarantee that they were going to make it, the Moravians, they were able to have joy and they were having peace and able to sing and praise God. But he was only thinking about his mortality. He was afraid. Am I going to make it through this storm? What happens, you know, if I die? He, he realized in that moment he didn't have joy because he didn't have assurance. He didn't have what the Moravians had, and he was lacking this bedrock from which joy derives in our lives. If we think about how we go about attaining joy, it's so often from things that they they cannot be fixed. They could change at any point. We could find joy in our family. We could find joy in our job. We could find joy in our finances or our status in life. But all of those things can change in a moment. In a moment, a phone call could change any of those things. Paul finds his joy in something that cannot be changed because it's not oriented in anything of this world. His joy comes from his assurance that Jesus started this good work, not only in him, but also in the other believers who were at Philippi. And it's because of having that assurance that the work had been done to bring acceptance so that he's not busy trying to do all of these things to be accepted. He could rest having joy, knowing who he is, is fixed. It is it is firm, and ultimately, the good work that Christ started, he will complete. We live in a moment right now where there's a lot of joy stealers, things that could extract joy from our lives, rob us of our joy. A lot of parents, a lot of you parents right now are thinking about how do I, what's going to happen with school. I um, mean, there's the gamut of, of, of ways that schools and school districts have tried to figure out um, how we're going to do schooling this fall. And man, there's so much stress around that. And every day it seems like things are changing or situations are unstable. There are students, many of you who have just come back either for the university or if you're in grade school, you're just thinking about what is school going to look like? I know at the university there's a lot of hope things will be able to be stable as, th as there's you know, so much testing and rapid results and everything that's happening there. Uh, for those in grade school, you know, just figuring out how's it going to work. Maybe we had a test drive or test run rather in the spring of online or in person or what have you. But how is this all going to go? And for some of you who live alone for various reasons, different stages of life, you're wondering when is this whole situation going to be over so that I could actually re-engage with people. For grandparents, maybe you're thinking, when is it going to be an opportunity for me to see my grandkids that don't live locally? Uh, and so on and so forth. There's less certainty today than we normally have heading into a fall. And then when you think about external things, there's so much in this whole political arena. How do you know what's true? There's things that are being said and there's people, you know, sometimes you hear a claim of fake news and then is that a true statement? And so there's less certainty all around us, many layers, our present circumstances, our daily routine, the things that are happening in the, in the public conversation, there is a lack of assurance that's at maybe an all-time high, at least in many of our lifetimes. How do we have joy in the midst of that? Our joy comes from being rooted in Christ, that our, our assurance of our salvation, that our assurance of our acceptance, it is fixed in him. Paul's able to pray joyfully because the Philippians, they have experienced this and he knows that they have experienced this salvation because they're participating in the process of spreading the gospel through their giving, through their service of him and otherwise. And as a community, it's good for us to check our heart and to check our life and to re-examine what are we basing our assurance on? Assurance. 
Second point is affection. Some people view Christianity as merely a belief system that if you just can hold all the main points together in your head, you've got it. You know, others believe Christianity is just kind of this relationship. And if you just kind of like, you know, you're, bit, you're in relationship, but there's not a lot of definition there, you're good. Well, really, it's both. It's a belief system, but it also is a relationship. And it's, it's, it's really like this. As a husband and as a dad, you know, being the head of the family, there's a lot of things that my wife and our four kids, we believe about each other. We believe about each other in terms of our character, in terms of if we say this, this is what's going to happen, our trustworthiness, our faithfulness, etc. But our interaction with each other is not simply based on what we believe. There is a deep affection. And as we look at the Apostle Paul, a lot of people, you know, could look at his, you know, read through this passage and there's a lot of words here. What does this all mean? Paul's a heady guy. You have to catch that he is a man of deep affection, deep emotion. He has a huge heart for the Lord and a huge heart for God's people and a huge heart for those that don't yet know Jesus. And he says, that he has this great affection for the Philippians. You know, it's like if I go on a trip, if I, back in the days when you go on trips, but if I go on a trip and my parent, my family rather, my wife and kids are back at home or if I'm away from them, like they're home worshiping with us this morning, you know, I feel this sense of departure, but also I'm still connected. So even though I'm doing something else, there's still that longing that's there. Pa- Paul the Apostle, he had helped to plant this church probably a decade prior to him writing this letter. And now he's in a place where he's likely 800 miles away. He's probably in Rome in prison. And Philippi is in Macedonia and really the first church in Europe. Uh, if, if you read the missionary journeys in Acts. And so Paul has had both time and physical distance away from this group of people, yet he says, I hold you in my heart. He says, I yearn for you with the affection that is in Christ Jesus. Oftentimes, we don't think about church community that way. You know, you might think about it in so many other layers. You might think about it in subgroups or demographically, or I'm a part of this ministry, or I'm a part of that small group or, you know, you know, this group of people thinks this way and this group of people thinks that way. Paul has a very different view about Christian fellowship. He, he, it's, it's, it's a lot like being a husband and a dad and you're away from your family and there's an affection that you have, a longing that you have to reunite. It's so appropriate as we are in this socially distant time that as a church community, we recognize we could have this level of affection for each other. In fact, it is appropriate. Paul says, it's right for me to feel this way about you. He was effectively socially distant from the Philippians, yet he was close to them. And as we walk through this fall, we don't know what it's going to look like. We don't know what case numbers are going to look like. We don't know how school is going to work. We don't know what effect is going to have on our lives and our daily interaction. But we can know this. Despite all of that, we could have deep affection for one another because we are rooted together in Christ Jesus. Affection. Thirdly, abundance. Abundance. Paul talks about their love abounding more and more. If you've been in a relationship for any length of time, and you know many of you have been married for decades, or in some cases, maybe you've had friends that you've known since childhood, there can be temptations or tendencies to hit a plateau in your interaction and your love for one another. You sort of get to know, you can finish each other's sentences, you know what each other is thinking, and unless you are intentional, your love could sort of plateau and you feel like you're on you're on cruise control 
Well, of course, marriage ought to have intentionality that we ought to be growing more and more in love for our spouse. That's also true for other relationships, friendships, and what have you. But Paul says it is especially true of our relationship with God. It's easy to, for people to feel that God is just, okay, it's a check in the box. All right, I'm on his side. Okay, I'm good. I know him. I do all the Christian activity. I'm good. Paul says, no, I pray that your love for God would abound more and more. And not only just love in a nebulous sense, but that you would grow in knowledge, that you would grow in discernment and in growing in knowledge and discernment in the love of God, that you would be able to, you would be able to live a life that's honoring to him then it would have real effect. You would be able to prove things that are excellent. You would have an ability to decide what is the right way to think about this or this person or how do I, how do I move forward in my life in a way that's honoring God? How do I move forward in our studies or in my family or et cetera, et cetera, as, as I walk out this walk as a Christian? He prays that we would abound more and more in love. He calls us to a place of abundance. There are many relationships you could say, well, I have assurance. I know how they feel about me. So we're kind of good. We're kind of coasting. Paul calls us, calls us, the scripture calls us to more. He calls us to having an abundance of our love for God. And so we think about joy. If we are rooted in Christ and having assurance that Jesus' perfect work on the cross is effective and secure for me if we can have assurance and 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 couple that with deep affection for one another because we recognize we are rooted in christ together that the reason why we can be a community is not just because we like the certain teams certain the the same things or we think the same way we certainly don't cheer for the same teams i keep being inundated with this whole baseball conversation about Cubs and Cardinals. I remain indifferent uh, publicly on that. Uh, But even though we don't agree on certain things, we relate to each other because we are commonly rooted in Christ. How does this look like in our lives? Like, what do, how do we grow in joy? I mean, because the thing is, We could walk away from a scripture and walk away from a conversation about joy and feel like that's just another thing I have to do amongst all those things already on my to-do list. How, like, how am I going to, how am I going to act like I have joy now? You know, like, how am I going to have this evidence of joy in my life that we're talking about? Well, the reality is, is that you and I can't, we can't just go out and conjure up joy that leaves us in the same predicament that we were in before that whole spiritual depression that I mentioned earlier. Paul doesn't just tell the Philippians, hey, you need to have more joy in your life, or hey, you need to have more affection in your life. Paul prays these things, and he lives it by example. Like in the opening of his letter, he says, it's Paul and Timothy writing to you. Well, if you look deeply, Timothy wasn't physically with Paul. Paul's in prison. Timothy is somewhere else. And so the fact that Paul references Timothy, Paul and Timothy had this great relationship of partnering in the gospel together and going out on missionary journeys together. But they too are physically separated. And so Paul is cluing us in from the onset that community and deep fellowship, affection and unity are an example that he's living out for the Philippians and for us. And for us to have joy, it starts with prayer as we pray that God would give us a greater sense of our assurance in Christ. I want to ask you a question, though. What are you basing your assurance on? Are you basing the activities of your life on trying to gain favor with those around you trying to live up a certain standard that you have for your own life, trying to um, 
you know, maybe you felt like in my upbringing, my parents, they never really fully affirmed who I was. So now I have to sort of go about my life pressing in my work world or otherwise to meet this standard that I've never felt that I achieved. Maybe you feel like assurance is something that you just, you just don't, you, you feel like you can't stop. You're like COVID, COVID has hit, the pandemic hit, but you just need to keep going. I wanna encourage you to examine your heart. Where do you find assurance? Because if your assurance is based in those other things, you can never have joy. But if your assurance is based in Christ, if you recognize you are a sinner and that Jesus literally is your only hope for salvation, that is the way you can have deep assurance being rooted in Christ. Secondly, as we think about our interactions or even lack of physical interaction with God's people, how do we grow in affection? I mean, it seems like that's an impossible challenge to grow in affection in a time when we can't physically see each other the way we normally could. Again, Paul is talking about affection himself being socially distant. He says, I'm praying for you from this affection. And he's setting that as an example that they might have that same affection for one another. We see later there's conflict going on in the church. And Paul's setting an example, and he's, he's setting this example through prayer that they too might grow in affection. I encourage you this. Maybe you live alone. Maybe the only interaction you get on a given day is your family or your roommate. Do you pray for God's people regularly? Because I promise you, if you pray for God's people, if you pray for the church, you pray for this community and other believers here in Champaign-Urbana, your heart will grow in affection for, for God's people. Your heart will grow in such, that, such a way that you can carry his people in your heart, that we could hold one another in, in, in our hearts. That's why prayer in this season is so vital. We have a Wednesday night prayer service, which we, it's open for anybody. But even beyond that, just in your personal prayer life, I encourage you to pray regularly for our church community so that your affection will be deeply rooted in Christ Jesus and that we won't evaluate each other just based on other physical or ideological attributes, but rather that we are commonly rooted in Christ. And finally, our prayer for one another could be that we grow in love as well as in discernment and knowledge. And as we move forward together in this fall, my prayer for us is that we would have an abundance of love for God and love for one another. I'm so excited to be starting off this fall with all of you. None of us knows what the next week or month will look like. Mind you, we wouldn't know what that would look like anyways under normal circumstances. But I do know this. As we get rooted in Christ Jesus, it was, it's going to affect our sense of assurance of our own salvation. It's going to deepen our affection for one another, and it's going to enable us to grow in abundance of our love for God. Let's pray. Father, thank you for our time together. Lord, I bless every person who's listening and watching this morning. We thank you, Lord, that as we walk through the book of Philippians together, that this will be a journey that will refresh us, that will strengthen us, that will in, in some ways strengthen our immunity against all the pressures of life pushing against us right now in this unprecedented time. May we grow deeper in Christ as we walk together. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.